Hi, it's Wednesday, April the 10th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. And today we're in Luke chapter 13, verses 21 to 35. Um, yesterday, well, we heard about knocking late at night and the master of the house not recognizing you, uh, no matter how many times you've met him in the street or eaten with him. Nah, I don't know you. Um, and I did some wondering about that, whether the master of the house indeed is 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 God or, or Jesus or whether it's it's my personal faith. Um, anyway, that was yesterday's wondering, and uh, today we go on. So um, here it is, Luke 13, 21 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today and tomorrow and the next day, I must be on my way. Because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So there you go. I'm going to tell you right now, I really like this passage. <clears throat> not because I can tell you what it means. It's not a puzzle. I like it because I hear, feel a great deal of Jesus' humanity in this. Um, so, well done, Luke. Uh, just the way this is this has been put together, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Um, but before I get into that, let, let's just, just, just let me point out the, the very first line, because it, it jumps right out to me, and it should jump out to everybody, I, at least I wish it would. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, said to Jesus, Quote, get away from here, Herod, for Herod wants to kill you. Pharisees came to Jesus to warn him that Herod was out to get him. Herod wants to kill you. Now, unless the Pharisees are running some kind of double bluff, like they're going to ambush him around the corner, so quick, run over that way, Herod's coming. Unless they're running some kind of ambush, no, what we're getting here is sincere concern for Jesus expressed by the Pharisees. See, I always grew up with this image of the Pharisees are the bad guys. And the Pharisees are always out to get Jesus. And yet, when you read the Gospels closely, you realize that it was, there were some Pharisees who, who absolutely had issues with Jesus. And there were others who, who didn't at all. They came to see Jesus. They sought his wisdom. And then, as I've speculated in, in the past, I think there were a great many in between, and of course they got drawn into the negative message. Instead of standing up and saying, oh, wait a minute, what are we doing here? They ended up going along with the ones who were the loudest, the ones who wanted to get rid of Jesus. But, but in no way do those voices represent all of the Pharisees. Nor do the Pharisees represent all of the Jews. And it, it, it's hard at Easter when you hear stories um, you know, that the, 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 uh, the disciples or the apostles were locked in for fear of the Jews. It's like, oh, there's this idea that all the Jewish people were going around trying to hunt down Christians. And I know that's exactly what was in my head when I was five and six years old and hearing those Easter stories. A better translation would be they were afraid of the authorities. And, of course, the authorities who were most concerned were the temple authorities, the, the Jewish temple authorities, the Jewish authorities, the Jews. But it's not the Jews, and, and, and it has fed such anti-Semitism. It's, um, it's horrible, the way we, 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 we often read Scripture, and the way that it's been shaped, interpreted, translated, um, without any kind of grace, generosity of spirit, or understanding of what's going on. In the text itself, you don't have to say, oh, well, I want to be, you know, uh, I, I want to be supportive or I, I want to avoid being anti-Semitic. You don't have to make that your goal. You can read the text and see it's there. And this is an example. Pharisees are coming to try and protect Jesus. 
it was the Pharisees' job. I mean, they, they, they were the defenders of the faith. They taught the people. They were the ones who, who were, in a sense, trying to figure out whether Jesus was the real deal or not. You don't, you don't just sort of, you know, um, let him loose on the people without a little, exa little examination. So they were trying to understand whether Jesus was the real deal or not. And some of them very much thought that he was and others not so much. And we can speculate as to their real motivations. Um, but the thing is, not all Pharisees were out to get Jesus. And I think that's important. Um, yeah. Okay, enough of that. Doesn't really do anything for us. Um, what I love about this is Jesus's, Jesus' sarcasm, his quick wit, his frustration, and his sadness. All of that captured in just a few sentences. And yes, it's very possible that somebody sat there and wrote down every word that Jesus said. Uh, it's possible. And that that was passed to somebody, passed to somebody who eventually makes it to the author of this gospel. It's possible. Uh, it's also possible that the author of this gospel witnessed some things himself or second, third hand, heard things, collected these stories, and then shaped them. And so, of course, um, quotes Jesus. Not because he heard Jesus say these words, but because we all know Jesus was like this. Or Jesus said, that sure sounds like Jesus. Uh, there might have been a famous saying that Jesus had, so we know, so we put that down. But we didn't actually, there was no stenographer. Very unlikely, right? And and by the way, that's not the way history was written back then anyway. It wasn't written to that kind of journalistic accuracy. It was poetic. The idea that the way things are, well, knowing the way things are, then Jesus must have said this. Knowing who Jesus was and what Jesus did, he must have said this. Um... And so Luke has done that and captured this wonderful moment, for me anyway. So they come and say, listen, Herod's out to get you. You can tell that Fox for me. So Fox is already not overtly rude, but it's disrespectful. Fox is not a lion. Fox is not a wolf. Uh, fox, is, fox are cunning, but uh, they're also pretty destructive. Uh, then they are diminutive. So, yeah, yeah, you know what? Tell that fox for me. I'm casting out demons. I'm performing cures today and tomorrow. And then on the third day, I'm, I'm, I'm done. So tell him, here I am. You want to get me? You want me? Here I am. Here's where I'm going to be tomorrow and the next day. And then, you know what? Then I'm going to go on my way because I got to get out of Jerusalem because, you know, it's impossible to kill a prophet outside of Jerusalem. There is sarcasm and humor in that. Herod wants to kill me? Well, then I'll stay around here for a couple of days while he can. But then after that, I'm getting out of town. He can't possibly kill me out of town because, because, and this is the thing that they, you know, Jerusalem is, uh, is where the temple is. And, and the, 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 uh, the saying, the cynical saying, the accusation, yeah, yeah, that people, they, they, they just kill their prophets. They just kill their prophets. Um, you know, anytime God has sent someone to them, they have refused to listen. So what Jesus starts off using as a joke, no, no, I better get out of town because we all know <laughs> you can't kill a prophet outside of Jerusalem. We only kill them in Jerusalem. But starts off as a joke, then also it, it just the way it's written, it, it hits them like, oh, it's so true. Jerusalem has had every chance to see God in the world. Every opportunity, again and again and again. And yet, they don't listen. They are so headstrong, full of themselves. Whatever it is, they won't. And, 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 they, and they just keep hurting themselves. How often I've desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing. Storm comes, predators coming. Uh, a hen will, I think it's cluck, is the word we use, cluck, uh, and bring the, 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 the little chicks together and then just like wrap her, her wings around them and just sort of comfort them, hold them uh, in scary times. Well, here it is. That's what basically what Jesus is saying. And I, and I, love, I love the humanity of Jesus in that, that sarcasm uh, that then turns into a sadness. But now I also love the divinity here too because 
Jesus has never desired to do that with his, with his arms, but God has. God has desired to be that, that, that hand and, and gather and, and comfort and protect. But the people won't listen. They won't listen. And I tell you, you'll not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You're just not going to get it until something big or dramatic happens. How often do we look at people that we love making mistakes and we keep going, oh, Oh man, I just want to I just want to fix that for you. I want to live your life for you. We look at our children that way. We look at all sorts of people which is like, "No, I I, I want to spare you the pain and the struggle. Why do you not get this?" And we might even say to an intimate, "You know what? They're not going to get it until something bad happens. They're just not going to get it until something just falls apart." You know, I reflect back on yesterday's story where where I was suggesting that that the master is not so much God that ignores us, but it's our own faith that fails to 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 provide for us when we when we when we need it because it's it's a faith in name but not in in reality. We haven't struggled with it. We haven't worked with it. Um, I I think about people in my life. I think about my kids um, who have rejected faith as a concept, uh, rejected God as a concept, or you know, they're just, yeah, yeah, whatever. I, I don't need it. And, 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 and I look at some of these people and go, oh, oh, I know, I know you don't think you need it, but there's going to come a time when times are tough. There's going to come a time when your, when your reach will exceed your grasp and you're going to want to rely on something bigger, better, more than you. And, and, and you won't know how to do it. And it's going to leave you hurt and bereft until you figure it out. You'll figure it out, but you'll figure it out in pain instead of figuring it out now while you can without having to suffer so much. Um, and then I resign myself to it. Well, it's, it'll happen when it happens. And it does. I take no, 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 uh, no prideful you know, like, oh, hey, see, I told you so. I don't take any of that in it. I am relieved that they will come to understand something. I'm just sorry that it took something dramatic. Uh, to me, that's what Jesus is saying. Um, I, I remember historians going, oh, you see, what, what Jesus is talking about here, of course, is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, and yeah, sure, this gospel will become known about that time. So in fact, Jesus might be talking about the destruction of, uh, of, of the temple of Jerusalem, um, the revolt, and, and Rome comes and crushes everything. Maybe. Uh, or maybe this is about, you know, the year 30. That destruction has not happened. The revolt, none of that's happened yet. But Jesus is looking around at the crowd who are anxious for what he's offering because their faith just is not making that connection. It's not making the real connection that it once did. Um, and, 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 and they are occupied by Rome and religious officials have to compromise and play nice with Rome so they can sort of keep things balanced. Then we got to fit Herod in there who's a king in name, but not really in terms of any kind of power. And you just look at all that and go, well, there you go. See, this is your house left to you. See what you've done. See what you've got. We don't have to wait for the destruction of the temple here. Uh, he could just be looking around in the year 30. I could just be looking around right now. Um, you know, family, friends, community, my country, the world, and just going like, do you see, you see what's left to you? The, the, the unfettered greed, the unleashed egos, the narcissism, the lack of compassion. Um, oh, it's just this one thing. Oh, it's just that. Oh, isn't he funny? And we laugh uh, instead of saying, no, this isn't funny. Stop that. Uh, these things grow and grow. And then suddenly we look around going, what's wrong with the world? It's ruined. This is a horrible place to be. Little by little, we've let that happen as we have let go of our own sense of integrity morality, our code of ethics as a community, as we've let those things slide away. I can hear 
Jesus saying to us. I can feel God saying to us. I can hear me saying it from time. I would just, I just want to hold you and make it okay. I just want, I just want to, to, to comfort you and, and let you reset because you're not bad. You just let things get out of hand. These words fit for me. They fit for me uh, today. They fit for me back in the first century as well. Uh, they ring very true to me. And um, I love the way that Jesus in this passage, much better than any mathematical description of the Trinity might be. But here in this, I, 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 I feel, I hear the humanity of Jesus, but I also hear and feel the divinity in Jesus. And it almost switches on that line. You know, it, it is the human in me uh, that recognizes the human in, in Jesus that's just going, you know what? You tell that fox. <laughs> He's out to get me. Look, I'm going to be here today. I'm here tomorrow. And then, then you know what? Then I am going to go. I'm going to go where he can't get me because, because of course, prophets only die in Jerusalem. <laughs> that's the human. And then in that moment, <sighs> Jerusalem. They just haven't got it right. And I try so hard. And now I start to hear God. I do. I, I am moving in their circles. I am there and they refuse to see it. The ego gets in the way. The agenda gets in the way. The, the this, the that, the whatever it is. Everybody's got their own agenda. Nobody is just listening, paying attention to my will. If the, only they would, they would be so much happier. They would understand what it is to be at peace. But they're not willing. See? See what you've created? But then I also like the hope. I tell you, you will not see me until the day, time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a promise. Sounds very threaty, doesn't it? I'm telling you, you're not going to see me again. You won't see me again until the end. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For some people, yes, it won't come until the second coming, until the apocalypse. I'm done with you people now, until the second coming. Yeah, okay. Maybe, or you're not going to see me until the time comes. When you say, Bless is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, you're not going to see me until you start seeing me and the people around you. You're not going to see my will lived out here until you recognize Jesus is me, is me in human form, is I am in this world with you. And you keep looking up to the skies, that's not going to work. Now, when you see here, so I don't think this has to be about a second coming. This is, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I come to you in the name of the Lord. You come to me in the name of the Lord. We are bound by our faith and we recognize in each other that commitment, that love. And that's when we start to see God in the world. But whether you interpret it as an apocalyptic vision or, or the way I've just described it now, the thing is, the promise though is still that God hasn't given up. You will see me. You'll not see me until means you are going to see me. <laughs> Haven't given up. Again, this to me is comfort and promise, although we often couch it in words that sound threatening. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to leave it with you. I, I, there's other little things that are popping up in my head, but... Um, but I think I'm just going to leave it with you and see what you make of it. So for now, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for the words of Jesus, especially when they are conveyed with such insight and creativity, such wisdom and such love. Thank you for the ways that they help us to see you in the world, recognize ourselves in relationship with you. God, may today's wondering bring us closer to you. And may we continue to grow in faith. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's enough for me today. 
But I do look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and we'll see what happens next. We're starting a new chapter tomorrow, so you never know. Everything's new. Um, until I get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you and knows you and loves you exactly as you are. Because you are. And God's love comes in and meets you where you are, but doesn't stop there. It also moves through you into the world in amazing ways. You share God's love even, even when you don't know it. And even more so when you do know it. So God bless you. Know that you're blessed. Be a blessing. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. God bless.